What we're going to talk about here is the value of a perpetual call option. Uh, and what this is also going to do, maybe even more importantly, is give us uh, an intuition um, as to how the call option and input options also relate to uh, changes in the risk-free rate. So uh, this is going to be the Greek row, right? So uh, we're going to drive uh, the value of a perpetual call option and then get some intuition as to what row should be. So to do this, uh, we can start with uh, uh, the proof, this is in uh, Merton's uh, Theory of Rational Option Pricing and book Continuous Time Finance, on why we never exercise a uh, European call option on a non, uh, uh, why we, sorry, why we never exercise an American call option uh, on a non-dividend paying stock uh, prior to expiration. Right, so that, uh, that proof is uh, first, uh, to show this, we have to uh, set up uh, uh, two portfolios, portfolio A and portfolio B. And portfolio A is simply going to be, well, it's gonna, uh, we're gonna buy a call option with a K-strike price, and then we're gonna buy a zero coupon bond uh, with a face or par value uh, equal to K. Uh, and then portfolio B, this is simply, uh, we buy the stock, right? We buy the stock today for S of zero, zero is today. So what we wanna do is look at the payoff on these two uh, portfolios at expiration of the option. So we have the payoffs here, uh, so if the stock price at expiration, big T is expiration, is, is less than the strike, uh, then this portfolio is going to pay K. So the way we can look at this is the call expires worthless, and then we receive uh, the face value of the zero coupon bond, so we receive K. If the stock price at expiration is greater than K, then uh, we receive K, right? but then this pays us uh, S of T minus K. Right? Uh, so S of T minus K plus K, that gives us S of T. Right? Uh, so this is the payoff on, on portfolio A. Payoff on portfolio B is obviously not dependent on what the strike price is, uh, on whether the stock is greater than or less than the strike price, so it just pays S of T in, in both states. Uh, now, the, the key here to, uh, to notice is that the payoff on portfolio A dominates the payoff on portfolio B. And what we mean by dominates means it pays just as much in, um, uh, in it's, it states of the world, so it, it, it depending whatever state of the world is, it pays more or just as much. And there are some states where it actually pays more. So the idea here, in the upstate, if the stock price is greater than K, it pays S of T, it pays S of T, it pays the same. But in the downstate, uh, portfolio B pays the stock price, whereas portfolio A pays uh, uh, K, which is the fixed value of the bottom, and also the strike price. Uh, and notice that K is greater than S of T. Right. So in the downstate, we would rather have portfolio A, and in the upstate, we don't care whether it's A or B. Uh, so uh, the idea of this is A dominates B, so we would never pay more for B than we would for A. Right. So we know the value of portfolio A has to be greater than or equal to the value of portfolio B today. Right. So that gives us this inequality here. So this is saying the call price today is plus, right, so this is the cost of the call price plus the cost of the, the uh, zero coupon bond today, so this is the face value discounted back to today, is greater than or equal to the value of the stock price today, right? So once we have this, uh, then we can simply move uh, the present value of K over on the other side of the inequality, and then notice that you don't exercise the call option if, um, you, you know, the, the call can never be worth less than zero. So, uh, uh, so what we have is the call price is greater than or equal to the maximum of zero and the stock price minus uh, the present value of K, the present value of the strike price. And incidentally, this is where we could go and show that, well, uh, you never exercise the American call option on a non-dividend paying stock prior to expiration. Uh, so, but we don't, you know, so that, that would be this inequality over here. Uh, we don't care about that now. What we want to talk about is, well, if we have this, then what's the value of a, a, a perpetual call? And interestingly enough, well, with this here, all we have to do is say, okay, well, what happens when T goes to infinity, assuming the risk-free rate is positive? Uh, then this term goes to zero, and we have the call today is greater than or equal to the maximum of a zero of the stock price, right? Uh, so, uh, so as T goes to infinity, we have, directly from this here, we have the call price is greater than the maximum of zero uh, in the stock price. Now, of course, the call price is also less than or equal to uh, the, the stock price today. So the idea here is the call can never pay more than um, uh, than than 
you know, if, if you assume that the strike price is zero, right? The, the, the call will never pay more than when the uh, strike price is zero, right? So it'll never pay more. Um, whereas S of zero is, you know, so this would be the stock minus zero. So the, the, the call value is less than or equal to the stock price and it's greater than or equal to the maximum of zero in the stock price. So we can conclude the stock price today, uh, the call price today is equal to the stock price today. So what is the value of a perpetual call option? Uh, it's just equal to today's stock price. And this is, interestingly, uh, independent of, um, independent of uh, what the strike price is. Because again, uh, it, you know, as T goes to infinity, whatever the strike price is is irrelevant, right? Discounting uh, to infinity, it goes to zero. Uh, so yeah, the value of a uh, call option today is equal to the value of the, uh, today's stock price, regardless of what the strike price is. So that's interesting. But what this also does, this is, this is the inequality. So more important, uh, at least for me, uh, use of this result is, uh, is kind of having this inequality in my head. So uh, a lot of times students will try to memorize, well, you know, uh, what the Greek value should be. So they'll try to memorize a uh, row uh, for a call option should be positive and row for a put option should be negative and, and so forth. Um, and, you know, I never try to memorize these things, right? Uh, you know, I, I do remember that, but the idea here is I always have some intuition. So if I happen to forget at a given moment, I can just run through my intuition and then know what the value should be. So this is, this is my intuition on uh, what value row should be, right? So um, just as a brief uh, reminder, right, this is how we write you know, what row is. Uh, row is defined to be uh, the change in the call for, uh, for a given change in the, in the risk free rate. And this is just, if, if you, you know, if your calculus is a little rusty, just a partial derivative. Um, you know, how much the call moves for a very little change in the risk free rate holding all the other variables constant. Uh, so what we have is this is positive and then we have rho um, uh, for a put, right? So, you know, if we're talking about a put, we have the change in the put for a given change uh, uh, in the risk free rate, this is negative. So how do we get this from this? Well, the idea here is the call price has to be greater than or equal to the maximum of zero in this term, right? So if the risk free rate goes up, then this goes down, uh, this gets bigger, and the call has to get bigger, right? So the way I remember it is, if you ask me how does the option react to rho, I just remember rho acts on the strike price. It acts on uh, uh, k here, right? So uh, in the case of a call option, again, it's gonna make k less, and in a call option, we subtract k, uh, the strike price, away from uh, the stock price, so uh, the call option gets bigger. And if you remember the payoff on a put option, this is just reverse. So here we have present value of k minus the strike price. Um, I mean, sorry, present value of k minus the stock price. Uh, and as k gets smaller, that gets uh, uh, so that term gets smaller, and the put gets smaller, right? So uh, when we have s of zero minus k, risk free rate goes up, larger. That gets larger. If we switch it around for a put option, uh, risk free rate goes up. This term gets smaller. Put gets smaller. Right, uh, so that gives us the intuition on uh, what you know what row should be. Uh, good, and I so I you know I hope you always uh, are able to if you forget to uh, to remember that intuitive uh, um, uh, relationship. Have a great day.